Our Vista Capital blog post for the formula, the definition, and calculation is the most popular article on our blog in terms of direct keyword search. More people come to us to find out how to calculate invested capital than just about anything else. And we think that's great. Invested capital, specifically, is the amount of capital put into the business over its life without regard to accounting name or financing form. How much capital has management accumulated over its life to generate its profits, or what we call NOPAT? It's the denominator and the return on invested capital calculation. And you can see my tutorial on return on invested capital. You can see my tutorial on NOPAT. And invested capital, again, is the denominator. NOPAT divided by invested capital. Now, it's important that invested capital represent all capital put into the business over its life. Because, for example, if you give a buddy some money, and he says, hey, i got a business idea. And he says, I need 100 bucks to make it happen. All right, you give him 100 bucks. He comes back and says, you know, I'm going to need another 100 bucks. You're like, okay, you're a good friend. I'll give you 100. He comes back and says, I need another 100 bucks. Overall, you give him 300 bucks. And then a couple years later, he starts paying you 50 bucks a year. And he's like, hey, man, you're getting a really good investment because you're getting 50 bucks on that 100 bucks you gave me. And you just have to say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I'm not getting 50 on 100. I'm getting 50 on 300. There's a big difference. So it's important to understand how much capital has gone into a business to truly and effectively measure the return on invested capital. I believe we do the best job in the world of measuring invested capital because of the work we do in the footnotes and the MDNA to go out and get all those scurrilous little details that you need to know the truth. And as I said in my tutorial on why data quality matters, you never know which data point is going to be the one that blows you up or the one that you overlook that can blow you up. That's why diligence across the entire filing is important. And we've built an unusual and unique proprietary technology to go through filings with scale. That is why FASB and other regulators rely on us to help them identify where companies are burying the bodies or where accounting loopholes are being exploited and to help them make sure that new rules don't include loopholes. We've been through 70,000 filings dating back to 1998 for 3,000 plus companies. We've seen everything there is to see and we have machines and technology that helps us scale this ex expertise and allows us to know more about everything. And it's also what allows us to look at everything because we get the machines to do the easy stuff, my highly trained, highly intelligent analysts can go through and identify the things that most people don't have time or patience to look for. I'll be honest, even my friends who actually say they like to read 10Ks, they got maybe one or two in them per year. Most people, and these are portfolio managers and major fund houses and hedge funds, have also will tell me, you got maybe one or two of these things in you, your lifetime. That's how boring and difficult they are. That's why you need a machine to go through it, and that's why I started New Constructs. So let's get to some specifics on where adjustments to invested capital matter. And I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you all the specific adjustments that we make. There's 12 adjustments that we make to balance sheets to get to invested capital. I'm gonna go through every single one. And if you want more detail on any of these, go to my blog post, 30 plus adjustments to get to truth about quality of earnings, and valuation, where I'll give you examples that show that every one of these adjustments can be material. Not in every case, but every now and then. And that's why I say you never know which one of the data points is going to be the one that blows you up. So, one of the biggest adjustments we'll make, and one that FASB has been doing a lot of work on, off balance sheet debt due to operating leases. We've done more work on operating leases and know more about off balance sheet debt than anybody in the world. And it's because we've been doing it since 1998, we've been collecting more data. It's a big adjustment. It can make a big difference for certain companies. For example, Amazon, over $4 billion in off-balance sheet debt. The most, most, most people don't realize is that Amazon is no longer the capital efficient or super high return on capital it once used to be company. It once used to be because its balance sheet is growing. It's in a capital intensive business now. Do you think the cloud is not capital intensive? If you're going to be the server farm for everyone, it's very capital intensive. Amazon's returns on capital are way down. Most of it's on the balance sheet. Most people don't even know it's on the balance sheet because they haven't. They don't see that there's $4 billion in off-balance sheet debt. Another big one is off-balance sheet reserves. That can mean anything from loan loss reserves, inventory reserves, all kinds of reserves that people are creating. It could be deferred compensation reserves, all kinds of things that companies are putting off the balance sheet you don't know about. You need to add back because that is capital on which management should be earning a return. And you want to be apples to apples as well as accurate across all companies. So we bring it all on there. We convert all operating leases to capital leases. We bring all off-balance sheet reserves back on board as long as they're related to the operations of the business. We remove discontinued operations. We remove accumulated other comprehensive income. We add back asset write-downs. That's a huge one. 
In fact, asset write downs can be a leading indicator for stocks blowing up or even fraud. In a recent meeting with the SEC, we pointed out that companies that have the most egregious write downs are ones that are some of the best candidates and companies they should red flag for fraud investigations. A great example is Dynager, ticker DYN. Right before they got busted for fraud back in 2012, We'd shown that over the prior three years, they'd done, they had accumulated after-tax write-downs of almost $4 billion, $3.85 billion. And that's after-tax, right? Their balance sheet was less than that. So, a lot less than that. In fact, their net assets were about a third of what the actual write-downs were, were. So, put another way, for every dollar of assets on the balance sheet, Dynagy in the prior three years had written down $3.50. That's what you call shareholder value destruction, right? Management goes out, they buy a tractor for 100 bucks. Three years later, after depreciation, it's worth 80. They say, oh, that's only worth 70. Shoot. <laughs> that's called, that's shareholder value destruction. Take an asset that they use shareholder capital to buy and later say that that shareholder capital is worth less than it was when they bought it net a depreciation. That's bad management. We track that. We have the best database in the world for that because we've been tracking these kinds of things for over 15 years. We also remove deferred tax assets and liabilities where they are non-operating and irrelevant. We remove overfunded pension assets because that's non-operating assets to get to the truth. And I think it's important to point out, look, we're taking stuff out and we're putting stuff in. We're not just trying to blow people up and raise a red flag and be scared, do scare tactics to make people think, oh, you know, everybody's, everybody's profits are bad. A lot of times there are companies we like because of the things that we take out of the balance sheet that is reported in the balance sheet makes the company actually look a lot more profitable than what people think. And that's a big part of what we do too. We're here to find good stocks and bad stocks. We're here to do the homework that most people don't have time to do. Remove excess cash, that's a big one. Huge one, you know, for companies like Apple, Right, which gets an attractive rating from us now. When you, they have so much cash on the balance sheet, and when you remove that, the return on invested capital is much, much higher net of the excess cash than it is the actual full balance sheet when you include that cash. And I don't think you should include that cash. They shouldn't be required to earn a return on the cash flows or the profits they've made in the past. It's important to point out that we remove excess cash. Excess cash is defined, and you'll see this in my blog post if you want to look it up. There's a white paper on this is defined as the cash over, over and above what the company needs to keep on hand to run its business. And you know, Microsoft has historically had huge amounts of excess cash. And you, know, you need to take that out of your invested capital calculation to measure the operational returns on capital. How much cash flow is Microsoft generating relative to the capital that's put in use to create cash flow? Naturally, of course, one of our adjustments on the notepad side is to remove any income related to excess cash so we're always consistent with the numerator and the denominator. That's a huge theme for our return on domestic capital calculations. Whatever we do to the denominator, we have to do to the numerator. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. What's good for the numerator is good for the denominator. Same idea. Prior to 2002, we had to add back a bunch of unrecorded and accumulated goodwill because unrecorded uh, goodwill came from pooling acquisitions, which fast be fortunately made illegal as well because companies used to love pooling acquisitions because they could basically go out and buy a company and not record the market value of the assets of that company on their balance sheet. They only recorded the book value. It's hard to believe. If you didn't live through it, you wouldn't believe that it's true. But trust me, these adjustments are huge in certain cases. And we, because we're going back to 1998, we're making that adjustment. And also because we're going back to 1998, we're giving people a better perspective on the 3,000 companies we cover of all the capital that's been put in the business over its life. And that's important to measuring returns on capital. Uh, we also remove non-operating unconsolidated subsidiaries. We're taking out you know, the non-operating subsidiaries, things that aren't really relevant to the true operations of the business. If it's not contributing to NOPAT, it shouldn't be in the invested capital. Another really big adjustment we make is for mid-year acquisitions or any acquisition after the first of the year. The way the financial statements work is that companies in their annual report only record the income from an acquisition post the close. So if a company were to close an acquisition on December 1st, well, they'd only get one month of revenue and income from that acquisition, but on their balance sheet, they would show the full amount of the acquisition. Greatly distorts returns. So we time weight that acquisition so that we only show one month's worth of the acquisition so that it's consistent with one month's worth of the income and revenue that comes from it. Big adjustment, particularly big adjustment for Tyson Foods. They show a balance sheet of 24 billion, we show 
uh, uh, invested capital of just 12 billion, and, and most of that is related to the adjustment of the time waiting of the acquisition or the capital related to the acquisition. Those are all the adjustments we make. Any questions, again, go to the blog, see more details.